Okay, everyone. So thank you very much for waiting and welcome to the third installment or the third series of webinars that Bonsucre is running on the changes to the Bonsucre production standard. And today's focus are on the human rights and working conditions indicators. So joining me today, so today's uh, webinar will be hosted by my, myself, Nahuel Tunyon. I'm the Standards Manager for Bon Sucro, and we are also joined with, by Kendall Salcito. Kendall is a member of the Standards Revision Working Group. She's also the Executive Director of Nomogaya, a nonprofit research group focused on addressing uh, the human rights impacts of multinational corporations. She has worked on uh, human rights issues in agriculture, mining, petroleum manufacturing, and infrastructure on all five continents, including several sugar research um, in several countries. Since 2018, she has served on both, oops, sorry, both the Standards Committee and the Human Rights Working Group of the Aluminium Standards Initiative. Great, so thank you very much, uh, Kendall, and welcome. Good. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. So just a reminder to, on, uh, to everyone, we are running a number of different uh, webinars uh, on different aspects of the Bon Sucre production standard. So we, this is our third uh, phase of the webinars. The first one was just a, a getting to know what the process will be like, what it, what it, how we will tell and how to participate. The second one that went from 25th of May to the 5th of June related to the changes to the structure of the Bon Sucre production standard, namely uh, principle one and principle five, which deals with the management principle and the continuous uh, improvement indicators. This week we'll be focusing on uh, human rights, labor rights in the Bon Sucre production standard. As you will see, uh, these webinars, uh, the start date and the end date is a period of two uh, weeks. It's because we will be repeating this same indicators, uh, this same webinar, sorry, over the next two weeks in a number of different languages and a different and a number of different uh, time zones so everybody can join. So when we talk about human rights and working conditions uh, in uh, indicators, what exactly are we talking about? So these are mainly the indicators found in criteria 2.2, 2.3 and 2.4 of the Bon Sucre production standard. 2.2 uh, relates to respect workers' rights to favorable working conditions. On the left, you will see the indicator names. And on the right, you will see a, a very short summary of the changes introduced um, change, um, compared to version 4 and version 5 of the draft standard. So in minimum age of workers, uh, now we've removed the requirements for light family work, uh, putting all uh, work minimum at 18 and putting some exceptions for young workers of legal working age but below 18 and also apprenticeships. The reason is this is because since the development of uh, version 5, we've also introduced a smallholder standard which has the um, like family work indicators there. So we didn't feel it was needed here. The other in the forced labor, uh, there's been no changes to the indicator, but there will be some changes to the guidance to make it a little bit more accessible for auditors and producers. We've also amended the, the definition on discrimination. We're just going quickly through the changes and then Kendall can elaborate a little bit more. Finally, there's a new indicator on abuse and harassment. Um, we've also put in new, uh, new amendments on promoting social dialogue in the trade unions. And the last two is the working hours in the existence of a contract. There's been no change. In 2.3, which are the ones that relate to the wages, um, the minimum wage, what we've done is we they separated out um, Minimum uh, two indicators that talk about the same thing. So minimum wage has to be paid to all workers, but there's two indicators, one for waged employees, another for piece rate employees. This is done to give um, auditors and operators more uh, guidance on how to uh, ensure that um, piece rate workers are indeed receiving a minimum wage. Um, there's also been a small amendment in, oh, but, but potentially quite impactful on the maximum now uh, number of hours worked. In the previous version of the production standard, um, the indicator stated that the maximum hours was whatever the national legislation deemed appropriate. And in the cases where the national legislation did not give uh, a, a maximum number of hours, then 60 hours was the maximum. 
Uh, in this version, it's uh, been flipped that, so it's 60 hours maximum uh, per week, regardless of um, national legislation. And there's a two-year phase-in for this indicator, meaning that from year zero, you know, you have two years to comply. To, so in the second or third audit, you will have to reach the 60 hours. Overtime pay has been increased uh, from 50, from 25% to 50% in line with ILO recommendations. There's a new indicator here uh, on uh, closing the living wage gap. We're gonna be talking uh, quite a bit about that at the latter end of this uh, webinar. And finally, then 2.4 talks about grievance mechanism for workers and social dialogue uh, um, demonstrating that uh, improves working conditions. So I hope that is all clear. Just before I go forward, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box, the Q&A box at any time, uh, and then we'll be uh, answering as we go. Or alternatively, uh, you can raise your hand and we can open up your microphone. We want this to be a dynamic webinar, a lot of audience participation, so please do feel free to, to make questions or comments um, that you may have. So with this, um, Kendall, I just wanted to, to ask you as part of the Standard Revision Working Group member, you know, what resources did the Working Group uh, look at when amending the human rights indicator in the Bon Secours Production Standard? And what are some of the contexts for, for it? Yeah, I think that's um, obviously a, a critical starting point. We looked, uh, we looked very specifically at an array of existing uh, certification bodies and multi-stakeholder initiatives. So the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, the Aluminum Stewardship Initiative, um, the, the Forestry Stewardship Council. So we, we looked at these standards processes that were out there as well as um, IFC performance standards. And then we also looked at evolving sort of international frameworks for good global practice. So, you know, the U UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the OEC guidelines on multinational corporations. Um, and then, and then, so that was, there, there were sort of the standards. And then in addition to that, um, we've seen evolving national level legislation in in the time since the last Bon Sucro standard was revised. Um, and it's moving very much towards international due diligence in the supply chain. So California, the UK, Australia, France, um, the EU made an announcement last month that they'll be looking at establishing binding legislation for home country corporations operating abroad. And so, you know, this had major implications for Bon Sucro, which is historically restricted its its certification only to the area designated for certification. And then finally, we also looked at essentially the changing global context um, as natural disasters affect the way that um, the way that operations um, interact with the environment and COVID-19 has been um, has been a real, I guess, um, force multiplier in identifying risks to production based on social and health issues if we don't address them. Great, thank you. Yes, um, and it, it's good that you mentioned it because in the previous uh, webinars, we also mentioned, you know, the same uh, justification for the changes, you know, changing international legal context, you know, it's also the realization that came from, um, from COVID and from others that, you know, just looking at the area of certification, it, it's not always uh, just enough and going forward. So I think it, it, it's a nice, uh, context sets you up uh, for, for going for the next question, which is, can you highlight some of the human rights issues and trends that you have seen gain importance over the last few years that are not adequately addressed in the existing, in the current version of Bonsucre Production Standard, and how we've sought, uh, have you sought to address them in the revised version that we're presenting now? Sure. Um, one, one really clear example is in gender. Um, the standard had previously had a non-discrimination criterion, but not a lot of clarity on how that would be implemented in practice. And there's a growing recognition that businesses perpetuate existing disparities by, you know, essentially accepting the status quo in the context where they're operating. And we now know that domestic violence, teen pregnancy, overall poverty decrease when women have a higher presence in the workforce. Um, and these rates drop further when women are in leadership. 
So the, the standard now is looking, you know, both at non-discrimination as well as, as freedom from harassment and abuse, because these are essentially two sides of the same coin. Um, in labor relations, um, you know, we previously tried to gauge effective worker engagement through collective bargaining rights and contracts and grievance mechanisms. And these are, to be sure, critical benchmarks for basic worker protections, but um, they're missing the in-between interactions that can build into major complaints or contentious bargaining processes. And, and so we've built social dialogue into this new standard to reflect um, you know, what is essentially decades old knowledge that involving workers in decision making and ongoing dialogue addresses information asymmetries and can improve the quality of managerial decisions even and mm. increase morale in the workplace and increase labor productivity. Um, even enhancing worker perceptions about the fairness of decisions, even if it's not necessarily positive for them. And so the updated standard reflects that understanding. Um, you know, I think we've made some major changes around grievance mechanisms. Um, there, there, there have been major developments in how we evaluate grievance mechanisms since the Bones the Grill was last revised. Um, you know, partly based on, on changes reflected in the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights. And the focus here is also on Indigenous communities and traditional communities because the rights of Indigenous peoples to free prior and informed consent on their traditional lands is now widely recognized in certification standards and lending standards. I think it's critical to include the, the right to free prior and informed consent in order to get ICL certification. And so this draft standard essentially creates the space to engage more meaningfully with indigenous peoples within the operation and in communities and supplier areas. Um, and you know, we've, you know, while, while it's sort of necessary for ICL um, alignment, we've also just sort of seen it as important based on conflicts we've seen between sugar producers and traditional peoples who are occupying plantations that they claim are on their ancestral lands. And in solving these disputes, the, the processes for mutual understanding are really critical. Um, and then I think some major changes that we've made around accommodation will probably be addressed in the health and safety webinar later. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also taken a hard look at wages. And I think we're going to talk about that later too, right? Yes, yes, yes. No, but, but it's true. It's, it, it's something that, uh, you know, with the current version of the standard, we always knew that there was a little bit of a, a gap there in relation to, to, to gender as well. So it's good that the working group, you know, has managed to strengthen those uh, sides of it. And it's also, you know, as you mentioned, labor relations is quite critical um, for the production. And it's also about how we engage and we communicate with the communities. Um, so we talked a little bit about the context and what are some of the human rights uh, trends that are, that are happening in the world of sustainability. But, you know, what, what are some of the risks associated with ignoring this? You know, why, why do I have to work on this? What, why is it my concern as a producer or as an operator? That's such a great question. Uh, you know, I think we touched on this when mentioning alignment with these mm. emerging legal frameworks that are increasingly requiring some mandatory human rights due diligence on supply chains. Um, but, you know, it's not just the legal liability. There is also this sort of supply and human resource um, issue. You know, companies that lack oversight over their supply chains can't prepare for shocks in the supply chains. And whether that's because a supplier is using trafficked labor that could be suddenly repatriated or the workforce is exposed to health risks that could jeopardize their ability to work. Um, you also have risks associated with community acceptance. You know, there, are, there are major issues when suppliers foster weak or strained relationships with their neighbors. Um, you'll see road blockades, you'll see field sabotages. Um, we've seen direct attacks on equipment um, and, and that's substantially higher when, when the human rights dimension is missed. Mm -hmm. Um, and then finally, um, there are growing risks on accessing financing. Um, the IFC has recently begun to look at supplier areas of its food and forestry and beverage clients. And while those investigations are pretty limited under the 2012 IFC performance standards, um, the standards are, are due for a revision <laughs> last year. So we'll be seeing IFC revising its performance standards in the next year or two and borrowers can 
certainly expect heightened scrutiny over their supply chains and, and supplier areas. Um, and, you know, there may also be shifts in, in what buyers are looking at in terms of long-term risks associated with operators that are overseeing their supply chain. So I think those are probably some of the main risks and they're also just, you know, tailored to specific contexts so mm. uh, they can proliferate. Great. Thank you for a nice summary. So my final question is, is just for, for the benefit of those, you know, who haven't looked at that in depth at the new standard yet, or, or maybe just want a little summary, is it, you know, what are the, the main expectations in the new standard? What are some of the, the, the things you will see just focus on or, or, or et cetera? Yeah, uh, you know, I think that the, the biggest change that operators are going to see is that you know, Bonsucro is, is system oriented. It's not issue by issue oriented. So we didn't just add issues into the ex existing framework, but fundamentally reshaped the standard to best help operators identify opportunities to affect systemic changes that can bring multiple benefits to operations at once. Um, and, and the standard as it's drafted um, is aiming to help operators start working on sort of the main issues around human rights while trying not to overburden them or ask them to tackle all issues at the same time. Um, and I think, I think you'll see this in some of the gap filling that we did in standards one through four, as well as these, you know, more substantial new stipulations, stipulations in standard five. Um, and those are, you know, sort of held as, as aspirational criteria for the first audit mm -hmm. so that, um, you know, in, in, in theory, operators can recognize the benefits of these incremental systemic changes, which will encourage them to, to delve more deeply into the standard five changes as well. Um, principle five. Then, uh, yeah, sorry, principle five. Um, and <laughs> uh, I, I think that a major focus is on promoting social dialogue and better relations with all stakeholders. That's um, that's going to be apparent to operators across the standards uh, because it is systemic and it's it's guidance that's pertinent from the agricultural operations in standard five or standard four as well as in uh, um, as well as throughout one two and of course five um, and you know I think we're asking operators to to build relationships rather than check boxes and aiming to make that make that process. Um, sort of a sort of a self reinforcing process that that demonstrates its own merits over time. Right. Thank you very much. If we have any questions from from you know from the participants now, please feel free to make them or also uh, raise your your hand, and we can open up your microphone. I do have a question here from Eddie. Um, it says, "What was the criteria used for two point?" 2.3, so we're talking about working hours, to move, uh, to move from legislation to 60 hours. You know, what are the, the, the economical aspects of this change and how were they considered? Uh, thank you. Would you like to answer it? Or would you like me to? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot and then mm -hmm. I'll pass it over to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, the transition from legal minimums to 60 hours was a, a very in-depth conversation in, in the working group and, and in the standards committee. Um, what we found in practice was that um, legal compliance with working hours wasn't um, there, there, there are there are there are contexts where the legal requirements are um, extremely protective and there are contexts where the legal requirements are virtually non-existent and in order to give clearer guidance to operators we went with essentially the the legal framework that was that was most cognizant of the necessary long working hours in mills um, without violating ILO standards and um, ILO ILO guidance has has evolved in the past eight years um, to, to be clearer on essentially the health and safety risks that workers face and the operational costs associated with injury and accident rates from longer hours than 60. And so that was essentially the ceiling that we could identify that wouldn't put workers at risk. Mm. 
Yeah, j just to add, just to, to, to summarize, sorry, it's, I remember a lot of discussions in the working group is, you know, looking at also, apart from the economic, from a health and safety perspective, as, uh, as Kendall was mentioned, and we took the, 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 IC, the I, ILO recommendations on this. We also looked at some alternatives as well, you know, fatigue management plans or different controls for longer work, uh, local, uh, longer working hours. And I just wanted to, to remind everyone that, you know, this is the first draft. You know, we, we put this knowing that there will be comments from operators. We welcome your comments. We, we, um, we, we welcome and we want to hear them. Um, also, not only in, is this applicable to you, or, or if not, if you don't feel this is feasible for you, how do you propose to sufficiently address the issue in an alternative manner? You know, if, um, you, know, it, you know, also apart from looking from the economic, also looking at the health and safety aspects of it as well. So, great. Um, so the next section we have is on living wage, but I just wanted to see, give a few more moments to see if they have any more um, questions on on this side of the on the working on the on these indicators. Don't see any more. No. Okay. None more. Okay. So maybe we'll have more questions on the living wage. So just want to talk about living wage because it's one of the new major changes that we've introduced in the, in this side of or what the working group has introduced in this, in this version of the, of the production standard in version five. And I just wanted to take a little bit of time first explaining not only what living wage is, but what was the process that went inside the working group to, to really, uh, to find this indicator, because it's a very, uh, it's a subject that's gaining a lot of notoriety, a lot of uh, publicity in the standards world. A lot of standards are moving towards this and a lot of not only, um, you know, different, uh, different actors are looking at how to, to, to improve living wages and the importance of such. But at the other side, we also see that there's a lot of challenges in implementing living wage from a very, from a technical perspective. How do you measure? What do you measure? Um, and also from closing those living wage gaps. So we, we, we wanted to, we reflected hard on this question and the working group instructed Bon Sucre to commission uh, some research on what are some of the possibilities. So I just wanted to share a little bit of the research that was con uh, carried out and then hand over to, to Kendall to see how, what the interpretation was from the working group and how they incorporated it. So first is, you know, what is living wage? We may have heard of it, maybe everyone has their own vision of it, but we are basically, what we are basically seeing is that uh, is remuneration received for a standard work week by a worker to basically meet their basic needs for their family and a little bit extra to account for any unplanned uh, or unforeseen events. Sounds, uh, sounds simple enough, but there's a lot of different uh, data points and a lot of different methodologies that uh, even take this definition and uh, measure it in, the, in very different way, uh, ways. There are no, uh, these, each uh, benchmark or the methodologies um, have their pros and cons and uh, it's important to, to select the right one. So we also looked at, you know, what are some of the, the living wage benchmarks that are currently available and which one is the most appropriate for us to use. Um, we looked at two main factors in determining, you know, and seeing how applicable they were for the Bon Sucre. Um, on the one side, you know, how credible and precise these methodologies are. Um, and the other one is how resource in intensive is it? Because we understand that there's a little bit of a trade-off in between getting the most granular um, precise, uh, credible benchmark, and also the cost, not only to, 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 to the operators, but to the system as a whole, the lack of publicly available data that needs to be collected, the, the difficulty for auditing. So all of this has to be a factor that, will, uh, that goes into deciding which benchmark is the most appropriate um, at all. So these are, uh, this is a summary. We have the report, um, we'll be publishing online for all of you to see if you want to, to, to see. But, but what it, we looked at a, a very different number of benchmarks and they can be summarized, you know, either there's, there's one is a, is a minimum wage, you know, that is a benchmark set by different countries. There's also the World Bank One uh, PPP that also it's, you know, $2 per day uh, adjusted per, 
adjusted. That's a poverty line. That's also a different uh, way of calculating it. There are some regional ones. For example, in this one is the Asian Floor Wage Alliance. Or there's more global, uh, global ones, such as the Wage Indicator Foundation, uh, Anchor Methodology, and SA8000, which coincidentally, the, la the, 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 the last three are the ones that scored higher on our criteria of how we were measuring these. Um, so, yes. The following thing that we did is also we looked at, okay, comparing, taking the, the data that we have, the bon sucre collects the minimum, uh, the wage paid to the lowest uh, worker, and also comparing, and then we, we did a quick scan, comparing with only publicly available information. How does that relate? What would be the impact to the operators choosing all of these different, uh, uh, with all of these different benchmarks? Um, the first, the first point I think to mention is, you know, these figures are just purely indicative. Um, they are not; they are based on publicly available information, and it's and they're not precise enough. They're not applicable enough. So, in the route, if we, if the living wage indicator is in, finally adopted, these won't be the real figures. This is just uh, just to have us a little bit of a show, of of what will likely impact be. And there's ma three main takeaways that we can we can take from this. You know, one is there's, you know, a lot of variability in, in terms of the different uh, methodologies used. They give you very different results. If you just, oh, sorry, just want to put a pointer. Mm. Oh, here we go. So if you see, for example, in this last, uh, in the last figure, the difference between, you know, uh, the, this is the final one is comparing uh, minimum wage compared to the different, uh, to the different methodology. So in this case, uh, minimum wage in um, Brazil is 51% higher than the World Bank poverty line. But in this example, it's uh, the Wage Indicator Foundation living wage is 120% higher than what is set in the minimum legislation. So the first takeaway we can see is high variability between the different methodologies used. You know, even if we see the wage indicator and the anchor methodology, they have a huge, it's quite a large disparity. So it's very important which um, methodology we use um, in order to calculate the living wage. The second, the second takeaway we can see is a high regional variability in regards to wages and living wage. You know, the, the living wages will impact uh, different uh, regions differently. As we can see here, for example, if we take the wage indicator data for South Africa, the gap between um, legal minimum wage and, um, and wage indicator is 223%. While in Guatemala, the minimum wage is 29% uh, higher than what the wage indicator living wage uh, stipulates. So we also have to consider how these different regional uh, aspects play when, when putting a re, uh, living wage indicator. And finally, I wanted just to draw attention again that there is a lack of publicly available data or lack of, of, of data in general to effectively calculate um, a, a living wage. By the definition, living wage have to be very localized and have to be very targeted at the operator who's using it. So this requires a lot of resources um, for the whole system in order to commission those benchmarks. Because we can see here, the, you know, the differences. If we take the wage indicator foundation, you know, there's a, you can see here that they split. There's two values. There's one for uh, urban, which is a high one, and one for the rural. But even in the different rural areas, these uh, values will change quite a lot. You know, one region to the other will change. So it's not, uh, so, so these studies have to be commissioned quite often and very localized in order to, to, for them to be accurate. So, so yeah, so these are the th three major considerations or, or, or some of the, the things to, to look at when, when we were designing the, the, or when the working group was deciding to put the, the indicators. So I just wanted to ask um, Kendall, you know, they, they made a recommendation, you know, how did you use the information going forward? Well, I, I'd like to first just say I'm really grateful to Bon Sucre for engaging so meaningfully on this extremely challenging issue. You just can't make a change like this to a standard without understanding the pressures on operators as well as the pressures on workers. And Von Zucro examined that tension intensely. Um, and that was extremely valuable to the working group as, as we tried to work through this issue. 
uh, you know, we mentioned that the proposed standard is systems based and wages capture that really well. There's this tight knit relationship between maximum hours and minimum wages and worker empowerment generally. And when addressing li living wage as a piece of this, we just first had to come to terms with the fact that Bon Sucro can't be an ethical certification body without demonstrating a commitment to seeing all workers paid enough that they can access health care and food and school fees and other basic costs. And there are short term needs for this because we don't want workers earning poverty wages. But there are also long term needs to protect operators from facing violent blowback when they mechanize or conduct other major business shifts that affects those low low wage workers. Um, you know, if the basic needs of workers and their families aren't met, their dependence on employers can create long term burdens on those operators. And we've seen this in practice. In, El Salvador, uh, operators tried to mechanize their sugar production and the reaction from laid off workers was to burn their harvesting equipment, every last machine. And these aren't people who enjoy cane cutting, but they have no alternatives because they lack opportunities. Um, and low wages and weak access to education creates this, this situation without alternative livelihoods. So now their dependence on sugar is an operational crisis for the industry in that country. Um, and living wage obviously links to health and safety, but also to human trafficking and food security and future risk generation. So in tackling living wage, uh, Bon Sucro really looked to, to the future of global cane growing and recognizing that we, we can, you know, to some extent prevent tomorrow's problems by trying to address today's social issues. You're on mute, Noel. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Kendall, for, for that explanation. So just, you know, so that let's run through what, what's in the, in the production standard. So at the moment, uh, what's expected is, you know, in year zero, you have to conduct uh, a living wage gap. The methodology uh, will be determined by Bon Sucre upon consultation with you on a future date, but it will, uh, and we'll, we'll provide the resources in order to do that, that benchmark. But the requirement is to close the gap, uh, close the living wage gap, which in actual on what the benchmark says, by 10% every three years. So I've, I've prepared a number of questions. I hope you can, uh, you can share your experiences maybe, or if you have any further, please feel free to, to, to mention this. So is closing 10% of the living wage gap every three years an ambitious and realistic targets? You know, if you're also working on at the moment on different living wage, uh, what are some of the challenges you, you are facing or, or, you know, what methodologies do you use as well? It'd be quite interesting to hear from your experiences. And finally, I've noticed, you know, we know that there are quite a lot of methodological challenges in implementing a living wage uh, indicator. You know, different standards are trying it, they're going through different approaches and, and, and to varying degrees of success. Um, so is there an alternative way of achieving the same goals? As, as Kendall mentioned, there's not only of, of, of you know, protecting future risks, um, but also ensuring that, you know, the basic needs of our workers are, are, are met. And what are some of these alternatives uh, and, and, and yeah, so I'll open up the floor. Okay, so we have. So the first, uh, the first question is uh, by Alex. Will Bonsucre share your living wage benchmark data externally for stakeholders that perhaps promote closing living wage gaps? Thank you, Alex. That's an interesting question. So it, that really does depend on the um, methodology that's chosen. Some uh, living uh, and, and how the data collection system will work in the end. Some of them uh, are not publicly by nature. Some of them, you know, are, are kept by the operators. Um, and we see, and this is sometimes a challenge that, you know, publicly available information is, is, quite, um, is quite scarce. So we our preference always to disclose everything, but it will really does depend on the model, uh, on the methodology uh, that we choose and how they usually operate. But uh, regardless, we will publish what data we can. For example, we can see progress towards closing living wage gaps will be shared on our annual uh, impact reports, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if that answers your question or if you have any follow-up. Remind you that you can also raise your, uh, raise your hand um, to ask a question or to, you know, to say a comment. 
Jesus, thank you. So it's a hand raised by Anthony Edwards. Uh, if you, Anthony, now you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, hi, everyone. This is just a, I find it difficult. Sorry, be, before you start, can you just quickly introduce yourself so we know who we're talking with? Okay, Anthony Edmonds, a farmer from South Africa. Um, I just find it difficult to actually grasp the concept of a standard mm. entering this, this area where, the, where it, was, it was a very simple process and the, the decision around a living wage or, I mean, a, um, a minimum wage was obviously in every different geography, a, a, a minimum wage is actually stipulated by the government or the Minister of Labor or whoever it is. And I would imagine that they're using exactly the same or very similar type of methodologies to establish mm -hmm. what they consider to be their minimum wage. So my feeling is that, and if and Noel, you you actually alluded it to it um, when you described the the challenges that there are to establish a, a, a living wage. Now we are entering that realm, and we are going to try and established what a living wage is in all these different geographies, mm. all the challenges. And uh, I just take, for, take our situation here where we've got 40% unemployment. Mm. Um, obviously the, the minimum wage, you know, is, is, is applied context. So yeah, I just think that we stepping into a realm where I think we shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe that, the, the wage, wages and the cost structures of industries in an industry that is so, has such variability in the extent to which it's um, supported here and not supported there. And mm. uh, I, I, yeah. think it's a, I think it's, a, I think it's a minefield. Yes. Uh, we, we've actually, yes, we, in the report, you also see, we've asked what are some of these un, unintended consequences and you're right. There is a, a huge risk in, partial adoption of these indicators that are creating a, a different level play, uh, playing field within uh, operate within not only operators of the same country, some are complying, some are not, but also internationally. Um, and uh, yes, it is a risk and we have to, we'll have to find ways of how to address that risk. Um, but also, you know, we also are trying to prevent the, the race to the bottom as well. You know, we're trying to, 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 to create something that look into to, to the future. Um, but, but of course, you know, this is the first draft of the standard. Um, we are open to all comments and receive. This is by no means the, the final version. Um, what we've stated here is our goals and what, how we wanted to achieve them is also very much uh, up, for, up for discussion. Um, but yes, thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for your question. Thanks. BG, you have your hand raised. Oh, divine, sorry, I will allow mm. you to talk now. And I'll mute you, Anthony. BJ, if you can. Okay, I think he's uh, lowered his hand, but he has made a question on the Q&A box. So regarding living wage, uh, did you do some case studies? What are the extra costs to mills or farmers? It will help us to understand the impact for our members. So. As showing in the in the research, the the living wage will really depend on what is the current situation in, in where you're located. Um, every study that uh, that is commissioned, there's lo there's lots of uh, living wage uh, studies that are available uh, online in the ISO, in the ISO Living Wage Coalition. But I can't give you an, a figure because it will depend on the not only the methodology chosen but the, uh, the place where it's located. What we try to do is have a, a gradual sense. Um, and if you want my, 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 my view, I believe that the figures related to the anchor methodology are likely to be very close to, to, to what is the, the, the situation. Um, so you can see here, it's, you know, we're looking at in, in, in different countries, these will be the different, uh, what will be the, the difference to farmers and millers. But there's also the other side of, of the question is not only what is the cost, but what is the benefit of it as well. And we've also addressed this in the research that, you know, there are sometimes we've seen, and there's some, the studies also indicate that there are um, efficiency gained uh, from increasing wages. 
Um, and there's other different, you know, cost recovery measures that sometimes in some cases it has resulted in a net positive. This will depend uh, on, on a very case by case basis. I don't know if that answer is satisfied, but I don't have a, a much more closer one to offer at the moment. Do you have anybody else have any other questions? I would like to jump in here just really yeah. quickly and point out that, um, you know, I, I'm sure Bonzucro is going to make an effort to get uh, the living wage methodology study available sooner mm -hmm. rather than later. But it would be really valuable for interested parties to take a close look at it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and South Africa was considered in the study. And one of the findings is that there's a pretty small gap between the legal minimum wage and the living wage based on the anchor methodology, but a much larger gap if you look at the wage indicator foundation. Um, and, uh, you know, insights from, from, the, from the context where the studies carried out and based would be just incredibly valuable to us as a standards committee for um, trying, to, trying to incorporate inputs from the ground into how the standard is written. So, um, now, well, do you have a sense of when this when the study is gonna gonna go public? We, we can put we can publish it today, and uh, just waiting for final confirmation from the author that we can share. By the way, it was South Pole Consultancy that um, no, sorry, New Foresight New that Foresight. conducted it, New Foresight, sorry, that conducted this research. So we're just waiting final confirmation that we can upload it, and it will be available, I believe, today or tomorrow, and we can share it at the uh, with uh, with the message that follows every webinar. There's another, there's a couple of other questions. Uh, when there is a difference between the national minimum wage and the salary agreed with the unions in a state or a municipal levels, which one should be considered? So it's a, it's a good question. So there are, uh, these relate to two different indicators. So the first one is minimum wage. You have to comply with the minimum wage regardless. However, in the indicator, so in order to, you, to be compliant with the indicator uh, on um, unions and collective bargaining is you have to um, act as um, as accorded with the collective bargaining agreement. So if your collective bargaining agreement is um, what you're paying is below what the collective bargaining agreement is, you are not compliant with that indicator and hence which is a core indicator. So you have to really comply with both minimum uh, minimum wage and also what's agreed between the, with the unions and the collective bargaining agreements. There are two other, there's two other questions or a couple more. So could you please elaborate that Ponsucre certified mills have lowest paid wage in your ben benchmark? What does it mean? Uh, in here, are you, is, is a question is why are some paying more than others? Because these are um, in different countries. So the first one is in Guatemala, the other one is in Thailand, and they relate to US dollars per month. At the moment, uh, the indicator relates to, you know, the, the current indicators you have to, um, to be compliant with Bon Sucre, you have to meet at least the minimum wage, which all of them do. Um, so that's, uh, that's why the difference is between the different uh, meals. So the other question is, which ICO, other ICO members have introduced a living wage in the, which other ICO members have introduced a living wage in the standard? So uh, there are numbers who are implementing in, in uh, different capacities. I know that RSPO uh, have introduced it and they suffered some methodolo methodological problems. So I don't know if they're still implementing it or they put it on pause for the moment. I know that Rainforest Alliance is looking at it and other standards are looking to incorporate not only living wage, but living incomes in a variety of different ways. And they've both written it into their standards, yeah. but, but um, sort of wrote it in without, without looking in detail at these, at these complexities. So um, they sort of did it, did it in the reverse of the way Bonsucre is trying to do it. Um, there's also a final, uh, another question from Rafael that I believe maybe Kendall, this one would be good for you. So concerning on 
three, which I believe is uh, working hours, my memory served me right. Has Bonsucre considered the fact that operations in certain countries operate under a collective bargaining agreement? Um, it's, it's a sort of uh, supreme document that protects workers and gives the right of the union to take action against the company for the company's breach of the collective um, bargaining agreement, including grievances, strikes, legal action, etc. So I guess the question is, how does, you know, how do we conform with trying to meet with the indicators if they go against the, the, the CBA? Kendall, do you have any insights on that? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't done anything to reduce the importance of the right to collectively bargain in the standard as it, as it is written. Um, 2.3.3 primarily aims to... Um, as absence of discrimination. Uh, no, 2.3.3. Ah, sorry, yeah, my bad. Hours work. Is, yeah. is um, hours work. So, um, we we recognize that there, especially in in Latin America, is where I've seen this, is that um, workers have a strong preference for the longer working hours. It increases their wages, um, and the take home pay is critically important. Um, and it can be extremely difficult to persuade workers and worker unions as well as management to reduce worker hours. In practice, what we've seen is that when they shift towards a shorter work day, the accidents and injuries decline, the productivity goes up, and the, and the shared benefits come across the board. You are completely right, though, that that comes with questions of, you know, if you have to hire additional workers to, to work a third shift, then does that change the pay structure for your existing workers or can you afford to hire a third shift at the same wage rates? Um, we have, this isn't, this isn't a new, new challenge to Bon Sucro um, mm. because plenty of operators were operating under CBAs in violation of national law even, I think. Mm -hmm. And so they've had to shift towards this. Um, and um, you know, I'll let, I'll let Noquel talk about um, how that's been managed in the past, but what I've seen in practice is that the change in working hours can be very controversial up front, but can bring pretty substantial benefits. So, Noquel, I welcome you. Yeah, no, just to echo what Kendall said, it's, it, it's true that it, for a lot of operators before that they had to get certified, they had to have that discussion of adding the third shift or, or amending their working hours. And this is usually quite a, a fraught relationship with the unions who, again, as Kendall mentioned, don't really have, don't usually have a preference for it because they're, they're not used to it. They like the overtime pay because et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they have at the moment had to, to, take some time in order to come to agreement with the unions and and to find compromises in order to be in compliance um, we saw we, we recognize that little interplay by saying that you know you can be certified and you have a two-year phase in for this indicator it would be useful to know that if that two year is sufficient in many cases it won't be I know of certain cases that it's taken up to five years in order to, to finally manage to change the, the added the third shift to be in compliance with the current bond sucre standard. So please, you know, if you have any recommendations to that, maybe it's, it is fine if we're looking at towards a two year, three year, five year, 10 year goal, something to work for, or maybe if this is not needed, it doesn't add any value. So please, yeah, do, do let us know on that on, on, on the comments uh, on, on the standard. So we have a couple more questions. Uh, let me just see if anybody raised their hand. No, nobody's raised their hand. There's a question that says, I believe a number of case studies will be necessary to estimate positive and negative impacts of introducing living wages. Um, if we don't have good research data, we will burn our fingers. All mills and farmers will see is extra cost. No, correct. You know, this is a, a quite a radical change. Uh, we will go slowly. You know, we will take the, the steps and, and conduct uh, unintended consequences analysis and impact analysis along the way. Um, but we're looking for here is in, in, we have the intention or the working group has the intention of looking at the issue of living wage and how can Bonsucro adequately address it. Then there's also the question of, you know, on the other, not only on the standard side, but what other institutional support is offered by not only Bonsucro, 
but by other players in the field in order to encourage wages to, to, to go up to meet a living wage. So yes, I believe a number of case studies will have to be developed. One, one note yep. on that though, um, you know, the, the perception that, that industry is going to balk at that um, mm. proposal is, was, our, was, our, was our initial fear as well. And actually on the working group, some of the strongest proponents for a living wage were actually our industry members. Um, and I think that's because they are in contexts where um, like an incredibly dependent low wage workforce um, has been almost impossible to fire because they have nowhere else to go. Um, so there is, there is some limited industry buy-in in some contexts, um, but, but you're absolutely right. I think we need to look broader than, broader than the contexts where it's pos positive and really delve into where it poses risks. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions or final comments? We have five minutes for, uh, remaining if you want to make uh, any final questions. We also, uh, I, I will I'll remain online at, after the end of this webinar for another 20 minutes or so if you want to continue having a more private con uh, conversation. So we have a final comment or one more comment from Kevin. I am allowing you to speak. If you can introduce yourself first, please. Thanks, Noel. Kevin Ogorzlik with Barry Calibo. First, Thanks to the, you and the whole committee for this wonderful webinar and for the significant improvements and uh, a big step change in the overall human rights element of the standard. So quick question going, or maybe quick question, going back to what your comment earlier around child labor and the requirements of using the production standard as well as the smallholder standard, mm -hmm. how would you see a mill or how would that be implemented in a place where you have a combination of smallholders and uh, more plantation uh, commercial farmers? So, so I think that what we've done is we, we if you remember in the current version of the, of the bond sugar production standard, uh, the minimum wage, uh, the minimum age, sorry, said um, 12, thir uh, 12 and 13 for uh, light family work, uh, 14, 15 for non-dangerous work and 18 for, for dangerous or hazardous work. We, that the light family work only was applied for a small, uh, was only intended for a small uh, farmer perspective. We don't uh, anticipate or we don't recommend that, uh, that small holders are uh, applying the bon sucre production standard, that they should be instead be using the, the small holder standard. What, uh, what does that mean in practice, especially for those who have mixed smallholder and uh, production? Um, you, you can split out. They can they can be compliant with the two different sides of it. Have to be com will have to be com uh, complied with. So, for example, the the large farms or maybe the mill-owned land can fall under the scope of the production standard, and then a group of smallholders will be uh, will have this uh, will go to be audited against the smallholder standard. So that is possible um, with the bond sucre system as it is. And as a reminder that, you know, the bond sucre production standard also applies to the mill, uh, regardless if it's a smallholder or not. So the, the, this indicator will apply to mill, uh, mills, mill-owned land, large farmers, and then um, the smallholder standard will apply to the smallholder production standard. Thank you. Good. And I wonder if I might elaborate just a little bit on that note, Well, mm -hmm. um, Kevin, you've heard us talk about sort of the applicability of the standard to the supply chain. Um, we, have, we have brought in the applicability of the production standard to the essentially the impact assessment process so that operators are aware of, you know, potential child labor within their supply chain. Um, and in, and in, uh, principle five, uh, sort of around continuous improvement. But in terms of the core criteria that are benchmarked, um, we are not benchmarking the, the, the conditions of smallholders through the production standard, essentially recognizing that, that challenge and the, and the tension between the smallholders and the larger operators. Good, thank you very much. If there's no other questions, 
just as a reminder before we close, the consult that uh, the, the production standards on the public consultation at the moment from the 18th of May to 31st of July. This 10 week period, we are actively looking for comments. So please do make your comments, suggestions, etc. cetera. Um, the, the draft production standard, the summary of changes are available on our website in English, Spanish uh, and Portuguese. Uh, you can, you, there is also a questionnaire that you can fill and send back to Ponsucro or you can contact me at any time if you have any further clarifications. We are hosting a number of series of different webinars over the next few weeks to, to, to go through some of the main changes. All the webinars, including previous ones, are, are recorded and published on the website uh, for, for posterity that you can see. The next one, the next series of webinars will start on the 22nd of June and they're on health and safety in the Bon Sucre production standard. I, I look forward to seeing you there. Ah, there's more questions that came here. So the first one is, I would like to know in the standard whether the child labor prevention is mentioned in supply chain as a responsibility of on sucro. Kendall, do you want to answer that question or? Yeah, um, this builds a bit on, on what I was explaining before. We've sort of allocated a responsibility to, um, to, certif to certifying members to evaluate the presence of child labor in the supply chain, recognizing that there's growing legal liability around what happens in your supply chain. Um, we have not through Bon Sucro allocated a responsibility to eliminate it in the supplier area, um, except as under the concept of continuous improvement. So if you, if you identify child labor in your supply area, then, then a key dimension of continuous improvement will be addressing the root causes of it and helping to eliminate it. Hopefully that answers it. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Draw this webinar to a close. I will be staying behind uh, if you wanted to carry on having a, uh, a discussion. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time. Thanks, Nahuel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Kendall.